Chapter One of Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous by Sarah Knowles Bolton. George Peabody. If America had been asked who were to be her most munificent givers in the nineteenth century, she would scarcely have pointed to two grocers' boys, one in a little country store at Danvers, Massachusetts, the other in Baltimore. Both poor, both uneducated, the one leaving seven millions to Johns Hopkins University and Hospital, the other nearly nine millions to elevate humanity. George Peabody was born in Danvers, February 18, 1795. His parents were respectable, hard-working people, whose scanty income afforded little education for their children. George grew up an obedient, faithful son, called a mother-boy by his companions, from his devotion to her, a title of which any boy may well be proud. At eleven years of age he must go out into the world to earn his living. Doubtless his mother wished to keep her child in school, but there was no money. A place was found with a Mr. Proctor in a grocery store, and here for four years he worked day by day, giving his earnings to his mother and winning esteem for his promptness and honesty. But the boy at fifteen began to grow ambitious. He longed for a larger store and a broader field. Going with his maternal grandfather to Tetford, Vermont, he remained a year when he came back to work for his brother in a dry-goods store in Newburyport. Perhaps now, in this larger town, his ambition would be satisfied, when, lo, the store burned, and George was thrown out of employment. His father had died, and he was without a dollar in the world. Ambition seemed of little use now. However, an uncle in Georgetown, D.C., hearing that the boy needed work, sent for him, and thither he went for two years. Here he made many friends and won trade by his genial manner and respectful bearing. His tact was unusual. He never wounded the feelings of a buyer of goods, never tried him with unnecessary talk, never seemed impatient, and was punctual to the minute. Perhaps no one trait is more desirable than the latter. A person who breaks his appointments or keeps others waiting for him loses friends and business success as well. A young man's habits are always observed. If he is worthy and has energy, the world has a place for him, and sooner or later he will find it. A wholesale dry-goods dealer, Mr. Riggs, had been watching young Peabody. He desired a partner of energy, perseverance, and honesty. Calling on the young clerk, he asked him to put his labor against his, Mr. Riggs' capital. "'But I am only nineteen years of age,' was the reply." This was considered no objection, and the partnership was formed. A year later, the business was moved to Baltimore. The boyish partner traveled on horseback through the western wilds of New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia, selling goods and lodging overnight with farmers or planters. In seven years, the business had so increased that branch houses were established in Philadelphia and New York. Finally, Mr. Riggs retired from the firm, and George Peabody found himself, at the age of thirty-five, at the head of a large and wealthy establishment, which his own energy, industry, and honesty had helped largely to build. He had bent his life to one purpose, that of making his business a success. No one person can do many things well. Having visited London several times in matters of trade, he determined to make that great city his place of residence. He had studied finance by experience as well as close observation, and believed that he could make money in the great metropolis. Having established himself as a banker at Wandford Court, he took simple lodgings, and lived without display. When Americans visited London they called upon the genial, true-hearted banker, whose integrity they could always depend upon and transacted their business with him. In 1851 the World's Fair was opened at the Crystal Palace, London, Prince Albert having worked earnestly to make it a great success. Congress neglected to make the needed appropriations for America, and her people did not care, apparently, whether Powers' Greek slave, 
Ho's wonderful printing press or the McCormick Reaper were seen or not. But George Peabody cared for the honor of his nation and gave fifteen thousand dollars to the American exhibitors, that they might make their display worthy of the great country which they were to represent. The same year he gave his first Fourth of July dinner to leading Americans and Englishmen, headed by the Duke of Wellington. While he remembered and honored the day which freed us from England, no one did more than he to bind the two nations together by the great kindness of a great heart. Mr. Peabody was no longer the poor grocery boy or the dry goods clerk. He was fine-looking, most intelligent from his wide reading, a total abstainer from liquors and tobacco, honored at home and abroad, and very rich. Should he buy an immense estate and live like a prince? Should he give parties and grand dinners and have servants in livery? Oh, no! Mr. Peabody had acquired his wealth for a different purpose. He loved humanity. How could he elevate the people was the one question of his life. He would not wait till his death and let others spend his money. He would have the satisfaction of spending it himself. And now began a life of benevolence which is one of the brightest in our history. Unmarried and childless, he made other wives and children happy by his boundless generosity. If the story be true that he was once engaged to a beautiful American girl who gave him up for a former poor lover, the world has been the gainer by her choice. In 1852 Mr. Peabody gave $10,000 to help fit out the second expedition under Dr. Kane in his search for Sir John Franklin, and for this gift a portion of the newly discovered country was justly called Peabody Land. This same year the town of Danvers, his birthplace, decided to celebrate its centennial. Of course the rich London banker was invited as one of the guests. He was too busy to be present, but sent a letter to be opened on the day of the celebration. The seal was broken at dinner, and this was the toast or sentiment it contained. Education, a debt due from present to future generations. A check was enclosed for $20,000 for the purpose of building an institute, with a free library and free course of lectures. Afterward this gift was increased to $250,000. The poor boy had not forgotten the home of his childhood. Four years later, when Peabody Institute was dedicated, the giver, who had been absent from America twenty years, was present. New York and other cities offered public receptions, but he declined all save Danvers. A great procession was formed the houses along the streets being decorated, all eager to do honor to their noble townsmen. The governor of Massachusetts, Edward Everett, and others made eloquent addresses. And then the kind-faced, great-hearted man responded. Though Providence has granted me an unvaried and unusual success in the pursuit of fortune in other lands, I am still in heart the humble boy who left yonder unpretending dwelling many, very many years ago. There is not a youth within the sound of my voice whose early opportunities and advantages are not very much greater than were my own, and I have since achieved nothing that is impossible to the most humble boy among you. Bear in mind that to be truly great it is not necessary that you should gain wealth and importance. Steadfast and undeviating truth, fearless and straightforward integrity, and an honor ever unsullied by an unworthy word or action make their possessor greater than worldly success or prosperity. These qualities constitute greatness. Soon after this Mr. Peabody determined to build an institute, combining a free library and lectures with an academy of music and an art gallery in the city of Baltimore. For this purpose he gave over one million dollars, a princely gift indeed. Well might Baltimore be proud of the day when he sought a home in her midst. But the merchant prince had not finished his giving. He saw the poor of the great city of London living in wretched, desolate homes. Vice and poverty were joining hands. He, too, had been poor. He could sympathize with those who knew not how to make ends meet. What would so stimulate these people to good citizenship as comfortable and cheerful abiding places? 
March 12, 1862, he called together a few of his trusted friends in London, and placed in their hands, for the erection of neat, tasteful dwellings for the poor, the sum of seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Ah, what a friend the poor had found! Not the gift of a few dollars, which would soon be absorbed in rent, but homes which, for a small amount, might be enjoyed as long as they lived. At once some of the worst portions of London were purchased. Tumble-down structures were removed and plain, high-brick blocks erected. Around open squares where the children could find a playground. Gas and water were supplied, bathing and laundry rooms furnished. Then the poor came eagerly with their scanty furniture and hired one or two rooms for twenty-five or fifty cents a week. Cabmen, shoemakers, tailors, and needlewomen— Tenants were required to be temperate and of good moral character. Soon tiny pots of flowers were seen in the windows, and a happier look stole into the faces of hard-working fathers and mothers. Mr. Peabody soon increased his gift to the London poor to three million dollars, saying, If judiciously managed for two hundred years, its accumulation will amount to a sum sufficient to buy the city of London. No wonder that these gifts of millions began to astonish the world. London gave him the freedom of the city in a gold box, an honor rarely bestowed, and erected his bronze statue near the royal exchange. Queen Victoria wished to make him a baron, but he declined all titles. What gift, then, would he accept, was eagerly asked. A letter from the Queen of England, which I may carry across the Atlantic, and deposit as a memorial of one of her most faithful sons, was the response. It is not strange that so pure and noble a man as George Peabody admired the purity and nobility of character of her who governs England so wisely. A beautiful letter was returned by the Queen, assuring him how deeply she appreciated his noble act of more than princely munificence, an act, as the Queen believes, wholly without parallel, and asking him to accept a miniature portrait of herself. The portrait, in a massive gold frame, is fourteen inches long and ten inches wide, representing the Queen in robes of state, the largest miniature ever attempted in England, and for the making of which a furnace was especially built. The cost is believed to have been over fifty thousand dollars in gold. It is now preserved, with her letter, in the Peabody Institute near Danvers. October 25, 1866, the beautiful White Marble Institute in Baltimore was to be dedicated. Mr. Peabody had crossed the ocean to be present. Besides the famous and the learned, 20,000 children with Peabody badges were gathered to meet him. The great man's heart was touched, as he said, Never have I seen a more beautiful sight than this vast collection of interesting children. The review of the finest army, attended by the most delightful strains of martial music, could never give me half the pleasure. He was now seventy-one years old. He had given nearly five millions. Could the world expect any more? He realized that the freed slaves at the South needed an education. They were poor, and so were a large portion of the white race. He would give for their education three million dollars the same amount he had bestowed upon the poor of London. To the trustees having this gift in charge, he said, With my advancing years my attachment to my native land has become more devoted. My hope and faith in its successful and glorious future have grown brighter and stronger. But to make her prosperity more than superficial, her moral and intellectual development should keep pace with her material growth. I feel most deeply, therefore, that it is the duty and privilege of the more favored and wealthy portions of our nation to assist those who are less fortunate. Noble words! Mr. Peabody's health was beginning to fail. What he did must now be done quickly. Yale College received a hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a museum of natural history. Harvard, the same, for a museum of archaeology and ethnology to found the Peabody Academy of Science at Salem, a hundred and forty thousand dollars, to Newburyport Library, where the fire threw him out of employment, and thus probably broadened his path in life, fifteen thousand dollars, 
$25,000 each to various institutions of learning throughout the country, $10,000 to the Sanitary Commission during the war, besides $4 million to his relatives, making in all $13 million. Just before his return to England, he made one of the most tender gifts of his life. The dear mother, whom he idolized, was dead, but he would build her a fitting monument, not a granite shaft, but a beautiful memorial church at Georgetown, Massachusetts, where for centuries, perhaps, others will worship the God she worshipped. On a marble tablet are the words, Affectionately consecrated by her children, George and Judith, to the memory of Mrs. Judith Peabody. Whittier wrote the hymn for its dedication. The heart and not the hand has wrought, from sunken base to tower above, the image of a tender thought, the memory of a deathless love. November 4, 1869, Mr. Peabody lay dying at the house of a friend in London. The Queen sent a special telegram of inquiry and sympathy, and desired to call upon him in person, but it was too late. "'It is a great mystery,' said the dying man feebly, "'but I shall know all soon.' At midnight he passed to his reward. Westminster Abbey opened her doors for a great funeral, where statesmen and earls bowed their heads in honor of the departed. Then the Queen sent her noblest man of war, monarch to bear in state, across the Atlantic, her friend, the once poor boy of Danvers. Around the coffin in a room draped in black stood immense wax candles lighted. When the great ship reached America, legislatures adjourned, and went with governors and famous men to receive the precious freight. The body was taken by train to Peabody and then placed on a funeral car, eleven feet long and ten feet high, covered with black velvet, trimmed with silver lace and stars. Under the casket were winged cherubs in silver. The car was drawn by six horses covered with black and silver, while corps of artillery preceded the long procession. At sunset the Institute was reached, and there, surrounded by the English and American flags, draped with crepe, the guard kept silent watch about the dead. At the funeral at the church, Hon. Robert C. Winthrop pronounced the eloquent eulogy of the brave, honest, noble-hearted friend of mankind. And then, amid a great concourse of people, George Peabody was buried at Harmony Grove by the side of the mother whom he so tenderly loved. Doubtless he looked out upon this greensward from his attic window when a child or when he labored in the village store. Well might two nations unite in doing honor to this man, both good and great, who gave nine million dollars to bless humanity. The building fund of five hundred thousand pounds left by Mr. Peabody for the benefit of the poor of London has now been increased by rents and interest to eight hundred and fifty-seven thousand three hundred and twenty pounds. The whole of this great sum of money is in active employment, together with three hundred and forty thousand pounds which the trustees have borrowed. A total of one million one hundred and seventy thousand seven hundred and eighty seven pounds has been expended during the time the fund has been in existence, of which eighty thousand nine hundred and three pounds was laid out during eighteen eighty four. The results of these operations are seen in blocks of artisans' dwellings built on land purchased by the trustees and let to working men at rents within their means, containing conveniences and comforts not ordinarily attainable by them thus fulfilling the benevolent intentions of Mr. Peabody. At the present time, 4,551 separate dwellings have been erected, containing 10,144 rooms, inhabited by 18,453 persons. Thirteen new blocks of buildings are now in course of erection and near completion. Indeed, there is no cessation in the work of fulfilling the intentions of the noble bequest. Boston Journal, March 7, 1885.